Amen. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 2. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha and Lazarus were among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she appointed, and she, excuse me, she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with this fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume is worth a year's wages. It should not have been sold, or it should have been sold in the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, for he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And so I want to read from John chapter 12. Now, often when we read this chapter in this passage of Scripture from John 12, we focus on Mary's offering. We focus on the anointing, the perfume that she poured out that cost a year's worth of wages. But this morning, I want to shift a little bit, and I want to talk to you about the unpreached portion of this passage. I want to talk to you about Judas Iscariot. After all, this series, Rock, Paper, Plastic, is all about money. It's all about your resources and how we handle it. And I want to focus this morning on this man, Judas Iscariot. Now, I don't know if you were paying attention when I read that passage, but the Bible literally said in John chapter 12 that Judas Iscariot, the man who is in charge of Jesus' finances, the treasurer of the greatest ministry the world has ever known, was a thief. Did you read it? Judas was a thief. He was a criminal, a liar, yet he is the one chosen to be the treasurer of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, look, if I had been there back in the day with the disciples, I would have been like, hey, Jesus, can I talk to you? Can we just have a word just for a quick, quick second? Now, Jesus, look, I know that you are the, the God of all creation. I know you're the one who laid the foundations of the earth. But really, Judas? Of all the 12 you could pick to be the treasurer, you're picking Judas. Jesus, surely, look, Matthew, he was a tax collector, right? This dude was studious. He was educated. He was, he's the right guy for the job. Surely, there were other disciples, Jesus, that you called trustworthy and blameless. Why wouldn't you give the treasury to them? Jesus, Judas is a liar. He is a thief. And you are trusting the treasury of the greatest ministry the world's ever seen into the hands of an imposter. That's what I would have said to Jesus. But after all, Jesus doesn't need any of my advice. <laughs> he is intentional in everything that he does. And Jesus chose Judas for the role of treasurer for a specific reason and for a very specific purpose. Jesus is intentional with all that he does. And Jesus was not caught off guard by Judas's betrayal. We're talking about the God who sees the end from the start. We're talking about the Jesus Christ who sees the intent and the motive of the human heart. You might be able to fool man and you might be able to fool me, but you could never fool him. He is not caught off guard or surprised by anything. Jesus knew exactly who Judas was when he gave him the position and the title. I believe today that when we see and discover why Jesus chose Judas to be the treasurer of his ministry, I believe you'll never look at money the same way again. And I pray that you never see Jesus the same way again either. And I pray that you never see Judas in the same light ever again. If you have your Bible, continue reading with me to Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. Why did Jesus choose Judas? Matthew chapter 6, 19. Jesus was putting action behind his words when he placed G Judas over the treasury. Don't store up treasure here on earth where moths eat and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. 
Store your treasure in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart shall be also. Jesus taught in the gospel of Matthew that we should not lay up our treasures here on earth where they can be corrupted, where thieves can steal them, but instead we should lay up treasures in heaven. In other words, we should be living for eternity, not the things of here and now. And Jesus was putting action behind his words when he appointed Judas to be the treasurer of his ministry. When Jesus intentionally chooses a thief to steward over the the rock, paper, and plastic of his day. Jesus was declaring to all of us that money is not such a big deal as you think it is. Money is not all that you think it is. And money was not the the treasure of Jesus' eye. Money was not the treasure of Christ's ministry. That's why he trusted it with a sinner, a liar, and a thief. I promise you, Jesus lost zero sleep over Judas embezzling the money in his bank account. I promise you, it cost not Jesus, not one wink of sleep because his treasure is in heaven in the things of eternity, not in the rock, paper, and plastic of the world. Jesus was putting action to his words and demonstrating that what is important to me is not what is important to man. His treasure was not the things of etern- or, or the things of the earth. His treasure was the things of eternity. Now I said just a moment ago that Jesus, I, I promise you, he didn't lose any sleep over Judas's embezzlement. But I will tell you what Jesus did lose sleep over. You might remember in the hours leading up to his arrest and betrayal, Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, and it was late at night. Jesus couldn't sleep because he was fixated on the price that he was about to pay. The treasure that was in Christ's eyes, the treasure that was before him, was the joy of spending everlasting life with you. What kept Jesus up at night was souls, losing souls, not money. Jesus was not worried about the material things of the earth. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of every good and perfect thing. He could speak and mountains would move. You might also remember that Jesus told his disciples, go out and catch a fish and there'll be a gold coin in its mouth and use that to pay your taxes and everyone else's. He was not limited by the resources of men. What moved God is not our money. What moves God are the hearts of humanity. And Jesus, his priority was not people's checkbook. His priority was the souls of humanity. Anybody believe what I'm saying today? Are you thankful that Jesus is more concerned about your soul and your heart than your checkbook? I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. (laughs) The reality is, is that we should treasure what Jesus treasured. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. We ought to treasure the things that Jesus treasured. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything that he owned to get enough money to buy the field. This is a powerful parable about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is actually in this parable showing us point blank where his treasure truly lies. In this parable right here, we see that Jesus talks about this man who out in the field finds a great treasure buried in the field. And in excitement, he hides it and covers it up again. And then he goes and sells all of his possessions to buy the field back. What this parable is painting is simply this. In the field of this present world, we have heard, we have begun to taste and see that there is an eternal treasure called life everlasting through Jesus Christ. And we must leverage everything that we have, be willing to let go of our love of money, be willing to let go of our love of the material finite world to lay hold of the eternal treasure that moth, that rust, 
that thieves cannot corrupt or destroy. The parable here in Matthew 13 is basically Jesus telling you this. My treasure is that I will spend eternity with you. That's why I died on the cross. The joy that was set before Jesus, the reason that he despised the shame and endured the pain of the cross was his vision of spending eternity with you, that you could love him forever, that he would wipe away every tear from your eye, that there would be no more sickness, no more shame, no more pain in your life. The treasure of Jesus is knowing that eternity can be spent with you. This is the culmination of the gospel. It is all about eternal life. And that is what Jesus treasured. And that is what we ought to treasure. If you believe the words coming out of my mouth, I just wish you'd bless the Lord like you mean it. God, forgive me for all the times that I've prioritized the present world over the one that is to come. This man who stood at this field and found the treasure. He buried it back in the earth and he hid it. There was a moment of reckoning where this man had to weigh the balances. He had to look at the treasure in the field and ask himself the question, is what I own right now worth me being separated from the treasure that I found? Or is that treasure so great that I should leverage all that I have, forego the love of all that I have to lay hold of everything that is promised in eternity? There is a moment in your life where there will be a reckoning, where you have to look at eternal life versus the present world. And you have to ask yourself, Am I going to live for here and now? Am I going to live for the earthly pleasures and the material gain and the respect of men? Am I going to live for now or am I going to live for eternity? Am I willing to let go of the love of money? Am I willing to let go of the love of pleasure here and now so that I can lay hold of everything that Jesus has promised me? Our treasure ought to be in heaven, not here. The treasure of your life Shouldn't be Ferraris, mansions, great sums of gold, silver, and bank accounts. The treasure of our life should be knowing that forever and forever, 10,000 years times 10,000 years, we will be in the presence of the most high God. Heaven is not my treasure. Heaven is not my reward. Jesus is my reward. He is my treasure and he is worth living. It's all about Jesus. What Jesus treasured, we ought to treasure. We ought to love him more than anything in this world because everything in this world perils in comparison to knowing him. Everything in this world is decaying, it's dying, it's giving way of itself. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 30. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy of their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. We should not find joy. We should not find pleasure in just the meaningless temporal things of the earth. For everything that we have now, it will all pass away. The things that are here on earth, the possessions that we have now, as wonderful and exciting as they may be, it's all fleeting. It's all perishing. It's all passing away. You came into the world with nothing and you'll leave it with nothing. The things of this earth are not deserving of your attention. They are not deserving of your adoration. There is one treasure that ought to be in front of all of us and it is knowing God forever. Spending eternity in his presence, that ought to be the treasure of our existence. Our treasure is in him and nothing else, not in this world. 
Turn back with me to John chapter 13, verse 21. You're gonna be doing a lot of flipping today and you're welcome in advance. John chapter 13, verse 21. Jesus chose Judas to show us that the love of money is tragically deceitful. Jesus chose Judas to be his treasurer, to serve as an example to all of us who would come after, to learn the perils that the love of money is tragically deceitful. John chapter 13, verse 21. Now Jesus was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other wondering whom he could mean. And the disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So what disciple, so that disciple, excuse me, leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Now, this is powerful. And I pray that this word unfolds for you, that you can see it for what it is. In John 13, we pick up here at the Last Supper, right in the waking moments of Jesus's time on earth. Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, one of you is about to betray me. One of you is gonna forsake me. And the disciples all looked across the table at each other. And they're like, who, who's he talking about? You, me, I, I don't know. It was not blatantly obvious to the disciples that Judas was the one who was fallen. His love of money was so well disguised that he blended in with all of the other 11 well-meaning, well-serving disciples. The love of money is subtle. It is deceptive. It creeps into your life and grips hold of you, attempting to rob you of all of your joy, of all of your peace, and the enemy has come into your life to steal, kill, and to destroy you. There is a powerful lesson here that even the 11 disciples themselves could not pick out the one who has fallen. For the love of money is tragically deceitful. It is deceptive. The other 11 disciples were totally clueless. This should show us that Judas was not the evil, cruel villain that often we make him out to be. Judas was a disciple after all. And many of the things that Judas did were good and they were great and they brought glory to the name of Jesus. Judas was not this evil, wicked villain that everybody could point to and be like, I knew it was him. He's been a joker all along. No, there was good in Judas. And I truly believe that Judas loved Jesus just not as much as he loved himself. And the truth is, is that you can look around at the world today and just like the other 11 disciples were clueless, as to who was in love with money. It's hard to identify the love of money. It's deceitful. It's subtle. It creeps into your life and takes hold of you, consuming you, intoxicating you. I believe that well-intentioned people who love Jesus can fall victim to the love of money. And yes, they love Jesus, but they love themselves more. This is a gradual, subtle escalation. I believe that Judas started right and ended wrong. I believe that he started with the right intentions, he started with the right motives, but he was quickly and deceptively led astray. The love of money is a dangerous thing. Money itself is not what is evil, but it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Look at this. Judas was a spiritual opportunist. When everything was going right, Judas was great. When Jesus' ministry was flourishing and the money was coming in, Judas was great. There were no complaints, no problems. Everything was good. But the moment 
things started to get difficult. And the moment that things started to get uncertain and the times began to shift, Judas became disillusioned with Jesus because to Judas, Jesus was someone that he could profit off of. Judas was vying for position, for prestige, for authority and wealth. And all of these things subtly creeped into his life. I believe that Judas started right, although he ended wrong. I believe that the love of money is deceptive, that it creeps into our life. It's not just the love of money, but it is the love of pride, the love of respect, the love of attention. I believe that these things are dangerous perils that that Jesus is warning us about through his appointment of Judas into the ministry. Judas was opportunistic. He was in it for himself. He was all about himself. Now, I know that when you hear that, you think, well, geez, I don't know anybody like that. But I want you to understand that today in 2018, we have bandwagon believers who are in this for themselves. They're in this for what Jesus can profit them. They'll be loyal to Jesus so long as everything's good. But the moment things begin begin to be uncertain, the moment things become unstable, they begin to change and begin to be disillusioned with their faith. There are a lot of people who are bandwagon believers and they like the positivity of church. They come in, they get their church on, they feel good, they leave guilt-free. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm doing great. They love what Jesus can do for them. They come to church so they can feel better about themselves. They come and they, they, they go to connect group and they bring their Bible and they love the attention that people give them. They love the applause that their relatives may give them. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, you're going to church. Oh, you're doing good. They like the attention that comes from following Jesus. They like to be admired. They like the friends, the community, the networking that the church provides. Some even like the idea of finding a spouse. Whatever Jesus can profit me, I'm in it. I'm serious. There are bandwagon believers that love what Jesus can do for them, but they do not love Jesus himself. There are people that love that Jesus can get them to heaven. Oh, they clamor on that. They love that Jesus can heal. Oh, they love it. They love that Jesus can restore. They love that he's provider. Beware of falling in love with what he can do for you. Fall in love, not for what he does, but fall in love with who he is. There is a great difference between loving God for what he can bring you and loving him if he never did another thing for you. Let me tell you this morning, if he never does another thing in my life, he is worthy of my praise for all eternity. If he never blesses me, if I never realize my ideal and my ambition, if I never am successful in my own eyes, if I never get what I want, if he never heals me, if he never blesses me again, he has already done enough for me to resound his praises for all the eons of eternity for 10,000 years times 10,000. If you believe the words coming out of my mouth and you're thankful, I just wish you'd praise him. Let it not be said of you, Vision Church, that you are a person who loves God for his benefits. Let it not be said of you that you love Jesus so long as it's profitable for you. Let it be said of you that you love him no matter what. You love him in the good days and you love him in the bad. You love him when your bank account is full and you love him when you have nothing. Let it be said of you that you love him when you're healthy and you love him when you're sick. You love him when your heart is full and you love him when your heart is broken. Let us be a people who are not in it for what we can gain. God, let us not be consumers, but let us be contributors who pour out our praise and our thankfulness back unto you. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just give him praise one more time. He deserves it. Oh, they're bandwagon believers for sure. 
And they love Jesus. If you ask them, do you love Jesus? They say, absolutely. And I don't doubt it. I think Judas loved Jesus. He just didn't love Jesus more than he loved Judas. You may love Jesus. Yes, you do. But do you love him more than you love you? Do you love him more than you love you? You don't have to raise your hand or get nervous or weird. Please don't. But I want you to think about that. The greatest two commandments that that he gave us, that encompassed them all. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your being. And love your neighbor as yourself. If you can do these two things, that encompasses all of the law. There is no law against these things. You are encompassed in it. You are free in it. That is what we were created to do, and that is how we were created to live. Our treasure must be Him. Nothing in this world. Everything in this world is fleeting. One of the reasons we called this series Rock, Paper, Plastic wasn't to be cute. It's, I don't even like the name all that much. But what, it was, what, it, what, it's in time, what it's designed to show you is that you're spending your life loving rock, Rocks, gold, silver, rocks, paper, and plastic. Your whole life evolves around chasing in the pursuit of these things. You came into the world with nothing. You will leave it with nothing. Are you investing your life in things eternal? Or are you living for the here and now? Because you may acquire great things here and now. You may. And good for you. (laughs) But what then? What then? The most successful and wealthy people the world has ever seen are miserable. Because the lust and the love of money is never satisfied. No matter how much you get, it will never be enough. No matter what car you get, it will never be enough. I'm going to tell myself really quickly, this is embarrassing. But the first car that I actually ever bought myself, I was young and stupid, was a really, really nice car. Could not afford it, but I just wanted it, so I did it. And I got it. I'm I'm, I'm struggling with whether to tell you what it is or not, (laughs) but it was nice. And I thought to myself, man, if I get this car, it's going to be epic. Like, my life is going to be great. Like, my life is going to be like some movie soundtrack. It's going to be awesome. And then I got it, and like for the first two weeks, the car was awesome. But then about the 15th day, I'm like, this is all? I mean, like, I thought it was going to bring me more than that. I thought it was going to give me more pleasure, more satisfaction than that. Is this really all there is to it? So what did I do? Was I wise and downgrade or no? I get a better car. I go and trade that thing in on something better, twice as expensive. Stupid, stupid. Because I thought, well, if the head car, you know, if that car didn't get it done, well, then I just didn't go. I didn't shoot high enough. So I buy an even more expensive car, put myself in even more debt. And then for the first two weeks, it's like, this thing is awesome. I mean, it's way better than that old stupid car. I, what was I thinking the first time? 15 days later, I'm like, is this all there is? Is this all that, is this, all that this really brings me? Is this all the joy? Is this all the satisfaction that this can offer me? Because the truth is, the lust of money and the love of material things will never be satisfied. But let me remind you, the greatest things in life are free. The greatest things in life, money cannot buy them. Money cannot purchase them. Your family, your children, your parents, your salvation, your relationship with God, your health, your time, your well-being, your state of mind, the greatest things in life are free. They've been freely given to you. Things that money could never buy, things that are priceless have been given to you. Yet it is amazing that the priceless, wonderful, best things in life are the very things we sacrifice in the pursuit of more. 
May greed never rob you another day in your life. May the love of money never rob you of your time with your family, not another day in your life. May the love of money, may the love of material things, may the love of more never rob another day from you. May it never rob your peace again. I pray that today we find contentment and satisfaction in the person of Jesus. And as long as we have him, we have all that we will ever need. I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. A few years ago, we were doing a a homeless outreach here in Uptown Charlotte, and we came to a gentleman who was homeless. He had nothing. I mean, he was totally impoverished. And I remember kneeling down beside him and talking to him, and I was just trying to show empathy and compassion because I did care. And I was offering him food, drink, whatever, And I will never forget what he said back to me. He looked up at me from his filth and from his rags, and you could smell him before you see him if we're just being honest. And he looks at me and he says, Tyson, don't feel sorry for me because I'm wealthy beyond imagination. I have all that I will ever need because I have Jesus and I know Jesus I have everything that I will ever need in this life. And all the bankers and the wealthy people who run through the streets of Charlotte, who appear rich on the outside, I have more than they will ever have. Because so long as I have Jesus, I have all that I will ever need. We could learn a lesson from that brother. I promise you right there, we could learn a lesson from him. Contentment, satisfaction, fulfillment comes not from the material world, but from knowing Jesus, knowing him. You see, the danger of Judas is that his love of money, I want to read to you 1 Timothy chapter 6. Turn with me really quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. I'm not going to keep you in here forever, but I do want to show you this. Jesus, I believe, chose Judas so that we may see that the love of money is the root of all evil. That gets misquoted all the time, and people are like, money is the root of all evil. No. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself is not evil. Money itself is morally neutral. Money doesn't make you do evil things. You do evil things with it. Money doesn't make you do good things. You can do good things with it. It's morally neutral. Money itself is not evil. The love of money is evil. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation, and they are trapped by many foolish, harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. The love of money is intoxicating and the love of money drives you into temptations that otherwise you never would face. I believe that just like alcohol can put someone in an intoxicated state of mind where they see the world through a blurred vision. I believe that the love of money does the same thing. It is equally intoxicating. It changes your perception on reality. And I believe that Judas was under the influence of the love of money when he rebuked Mary's worship as she poured out the oil upon his feet. I believe that Judas was under the influence of the love of money when he stole money from the very creator himself and his disciples. I believe Judas was intoxicated when he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Judas thought he had money, but no money had him. And I want to ask you today, do you have money or does money have you? Judas thought he was in control of the situation. 
but he was intoxicated. He thought he could handle it. He thought he was in control, but he wasn't. It was, call, it was blurring his judgment. He was doing things that were irrational, crazy, illogical. He was blinded by the love of money and the love of money blinds you to the things of eternity. It blinds us. Father, may we be content with who you are. May we be content with what we have. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 5 through 8, teach us that so long as we have food to eat and clothes on our body, we should be content and satisfied. True contentment is godliness. Father, help us to be thankful for what we have. Help us to take our eyes off of what we want and let us be thankful for what you've already given us. <clears throat> as the band helps me close, I want to show you one more thing. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 through 5. This is powerful. And I pray that you receive what I'm about to say to you because this will change your life if you receive this. Jesus chose Judas to be his treasurer, to be his disciple, to show us the difference between remorse and repentance. Jesus chose Judas so that through his life, we would glean the understanding, the difference between remorse and repentance. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3. <clears throat> when Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted. That's your problem. Then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. It's a powerful verse, a grim one at that, but one that we should look deeply into. You see, the thing that you must understand about Matthew 27 is that the same night that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss was the same night that Peter betrayed Jesus three times. Now watch this. The very night that Judas betrayed Jesus for the price of a slave and kissed him to give him away, that very night, Peter, the apostle Peter, the disciple, denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. One of these men felt remorse and the other experienced repentance. And it is vitally important that you and I understand the distinction between the two. You see, Judas, in his remorse, he tried to take matters into his own hands. He felt remorse he felt shame and guilty over the sin that he had committed. And remorse drives a person to try to save face, to try to clear their name. That's what Judas was doing when he went back to the high priest and he threw the silver at their feet. He was trying to recompense. He was trying to make right his wrongs. Remorse drives us to try to manufacture our own forgiveness. Remorse drives us to take matters into our own hands and to try to right the wrongs of our past. And many people in the church have experienced remorse. They felt guilt and shame over the mistakes that they've made in their life. But instead of repenting, they've been remorseful and they've tried to make right their wrongs. They've tried to do more good deeds that would outweigh their bad. They've tried to do good for evil. They've tried to balance the scales in their own life. But remorse did not solve Judas's problem. Judas died in his sin. But Peter died to his sin. You see, 
Remorse says, I'm gonna fix it. I'm gonna handle it. I'm gonna do good deeds that are gonna outweigh my bad. But, but repentance, Peter fell at the feet of Jesus and asked for forgiveness, for mercy. He didn't, he realized that he was powerless to make his wrongs right, but he understood that the one who lived, the one who died on the cross, the one who shed his blood, Peter knew that forgiveness and redemption and righteousness was found not in him manufacturing it, but it was found through repentance and surrendering to Jesus Christ. Today, You may be in this room today and you feel guilty. You feel shame for the things that you've done, for the decisions that you've made, for the love of money, the love of material things. And you feel guilty and you feel shamed for what you've done. Let us look deeply into the life of Judas and let your remorse, let it turn to repentance. Don't try to take matters into your own hands. Don't try to outwork your bad deeds. Don't try to earn your own salvation, but instead surrender, repent, and call upon the name of the Lord. The gospel is the best news the world will ever hear, and it declares to all humanity that your sins will be counted against you. No longer you are forgiven, you are free if you will confess, repent, and believe. Anybody thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Thank you.